Hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about one of my favorite things in the body. Those are your brain cells. Our brain cells are referred to as neurons. So let's talk about the neuron. What you can see in this picture is a typical picture representation of a neuron. And I like this picture because it's relatively detailed rather than what you normally see is a drawing like this that's supposed to represent a really complicated cell. What you see instead when you look at a neuron is that they're very complicated. They have multiple projections on them that we call dendrites. We see them labeled right there. And dendrites are the receiving portion of the neuron. That is where you will find receptors which can bind various things. When something has the ability to bind to a receptor, we call it a ligand. Some people say ligand. You can say it however you want as long as you say it with confidence. And a ligand is something that when bound to a receptor, allows that receptor to make a conformational or a shape change to initiate some sort of activity in that cell. But we'll get there in a little bit. First, let's just go over the parts of the neuron. As I mentioned, we have our dendrites. That's where you'll find the bulk of the receptors. And those are located on the cell body of the neuron. And we also use the term soma to refer to the body of the cell. Up in the soma area, you'll find all the typical cellular organelles you would see in most other places. You'll find mitochondria, you'll find an endoplasmic reticulum and ribosomes and a Golgi apparatus. Neurons are just specialized cells, meaning that they are cells with the same component parts that we would expect to see in other parts of the body. However, they have a special job. And if we had to define a job for a neuron, we would say that generally a neuron's job is to make neurotransmitter. And neurotransmitter is a type of substance that when released from a neuron can bind to receptors and cause activity in adjacent neurons. And so those neurotransmitters are created in the same cellular processes and the same types of cellular locations up in the soma that you would predict in any other cell. And as those neurotransmitters are produced, they get trafficked along the length of the next part of the neuron after the cell body we refer to as the axon. And the axon has varying lengths depending upon where the neuron is located, but basically it is the part that is going to connect the soma with its dendrites down to the very end of the neuron that releases the neurotransmitter that's been created. And this very end of the neuron is called the terminal space or the axon terminal. That is where you'll see neurotransmitters released. Some other things that you should know about neurons along the length of their axon, some of them contain a waxy cholesterol-like substance referred to as myelin. And this cell has a myelin sheath that is indicative of the peripheral nervous system. And we can tell that because in the peripheral nervous system, myelin is made up of cells called Schwann cells that wrap themselves many, many times, kind of like paper towels around a roll to cover the length of the axon. And in between these rolled up cells that make up this myelin sheath, you'll find spaces. And those little spaces are referred to as nodes, the nodes of Ranvier. And one thing that is special about nodes of Ranvier is that they contain a high amount of voltage-gated receptors. That's going to be important for synaptic communication, which we'll talk about in another lecture.
So if a cell is myelinated, if there's something that surrounds it, that means that that waxy cholesterol substance ensures that the activity of that cell, the charge of that cell is well preserved, and also that it's a fast type of conduction. Cells that have myelin on them conduct information a lot faster than cells without myelin. One other thing to note regarding the axon and myelin is an area right below the cell body before we have the beginning truly of the axon and its myelin is an area called the axon hillock. And the axon hillock has a large amount also of voltage-gated channels. And we would say that the axon hillock is the start of action potential propagation. So in getting neurons to be able to carry out their activity, carry out their action as the main functional unit of the brain, of the central nervous system, they have to receive information through their dendrites. That information has to be conveyed down through the length of their axon. And when that information leaves the neuron in the form of a neurotransmitter, the neurotransmitter will then go to a second set of neurons. And in most cases, many, many neurons. Generally, we're talking about 200,000 inputs that are attached to another neuron. And when these cells communicate with each other, they're using neurotransmitter. But when we're talking about activity within a cell, within one neuron itself, it is going to involve the transmission of ions, of charged particles. Every cell has its own resting charge where it is comfortable, where there is a adequate and perfectly balanced concentration of things like sodium and potassium inside and outside of the cell. You might also know that most every cell in the body has something called a sodium potassium pump that helps regulate the charge of that cell by keeping the concentration of sodium and potassium relatively stable. Neurons definitely have a sodium potassium pump because they are what we refer to as excitable cells. So here's the deal with excitable cells. They are not always on. There are some cells in your body that are always active. Your skin cells are pretty much always active. Liver cells that make up the parenchyma are just liver cells. They can be on all of the time. They can be active. Some cells we don't want on all of the time because their action, their activity, if it was constant, would be detrimental to the body. So Neurons are a form of excitable cells that we need to turn on. And when we talk about turning things on, that means we have to stimulate them. And the way that we stimulate excitable cells is by allowing in some way the entry of positive ions into that cell. Positive ions increase the charge of a cell and make it more likely to perform its action. When a cell is activated, it will perform its action, its designated activity that it does in the body. And neurons, their action, their general job in the body is to make and then release neurotransmitter. The charge at which they will perform their action, release in this case neurotransmitter, is referred to as the action potential. Potential being in reference to a charge, specifically in millivolts. And again, action is referring to whatever that cell's job is. An action potential in a muscle cell will lead to contraction. That's muscle's action. In neurons, their action is the release of neurotransmitter. The main positive ion in the extracellular fluid is sodium in almost all parts of the body. And because things flow from high to low concentration, it is relatively likely that when it gets a chance to, sodium will diffuse into a cell. And when enough sodium flows into a neuron, we can turn it on, we can excite it, which means it can release its neurotransmitter.
if a neuron was consistently having action potentials and constantly having neurotransmitter release, we would see things that were abnormal, like seizure activity. So we only want to turn those cells on when we absolutely need to. And we do so by allowing them to be sufficiently stimulated. The cause of their stimulation or the impetus which starts this flow of ions is different depending on what kind of neuron we're talking about. Some sensory neurons, they are stimulated through a mechanical disturbance. Maybe something is touching you or there's pressure that activates that receptor. Chemical things like neurotransmitters or ions, something, some sort of ligand that binds to a receptor. There's also tissues in the body that have open channels to other cells around them. And the ions can flow through these open channels called gap junctions. Those can allow action potential propagation. And as we'll talk about in the synaptic transmission talk, if you are in for another treat, reaching something called their threshold potential allows a cell to be able to perform its action, to have an action potential. The flow of information, the flow of ions in a neuron is in a one-way direction. That spread of activation is going to begin at the level of the dendrites, th flow through the soma, and at the level of the axon hillock, we'll start to see the propagation of the charge, the potential that will lead to the activity or the action of that cell. As we said just a little while ago, some neurons are myelinated. They have a waxy cholesterol-like substance encasing them. And that is really similar to the rubber or whatever it is that coats a wire and makes sure the charge stays inside of your wire so that when you plug in your laptop, the electricity goes from the wall through the cord into your laptop. If we strip off some of that protective coating and the wires are now just open out to the world, if you touch that cord, you can receive some of that electricity. We don't have a good signal going from point A to point B. So myelin is going to preserve this signal in the same way that we can encase a wire to make sure electricity doesn't flow out of a cord. When we have this myelin, not only do we have a greater signal because it is contained within this axon and then myelin, it is also faster because at these nodes of Ranvier, we have very high concentration of voltage-gated channels. So when a cell like this neuron has sodium coming in and we get this activation, that activation can jump from node to node to node. And that is called saltatory conduction. Whereas a neuron that is not myelinated has to open up ion channels all along the length of its axon to allow the entry of positive ions into the cell. So not only do we have a greater chance that some of that charge is lost, it's also going to be slower. There's nothing wrong with non-myelinated neurons. You have them all over in the body. It's just that they're slower. They're a little bit different and special. So as I mentioned, when a cell needs to be turned on, when we want to excite an excitable cell, that process is going to begin up in the level of the dendrites. Let me get in here a little bit for you. The dendrites are the site of most of the receptors. You'll have some on the soma as well, but on the dendrites, you have large concentration of receptors. And those receptors can bind substances like neurotransmitter or hormones or whatever, drugs. When those ligands bind to receptors and allow a pore channel to open, we refer to those receptors first off as ligand gated. Whatever word comes before gated is what opens up a channel, opens up 
some sort of receptor unit. So these ligand-gated receptors are at high concentration on the dendrites, meaning when something binds, when a ligand makes contact with an area on the receptor, that causes a shape change of the receptor. And we call that a conformational change. And that shape change allows a pore channel to open in that receptor to allow the influx of positive ions. And generally, if you memorize that action potentials involve the inward flow of sodium, you're probably going to be correct. Sodium is in high concentration in the extracellular fluid, and it will flow woo, into a cell whenever it gets the chance. So when a ligand binds, and allows a pore channel to open, sodium will enter into the cell. Sodium is a positive ion, meaning that it has a positive charge associated with it. When enough sodium goes from the outside to the inside of the cell because of different substances, ligands binding all over, when enough sodium enters the cell, we can excite it. We can change its charge. When a cell becomes less negative, we call that a depolarization. When a cell is depolarized, we're removing the negativity from it. Like you de-ice your car, you remove the ice. In depolarization, we're removing that negativity. When sodium, a positive ion, rushes into a cell, it's going to raise up the charge. That's your depolarization. So at this point in time, when we have the initial entry of sodium into the cell, initially we have the cell at its resting potential. And a resting potential is really just where, again, that cell is comfortable and happy and the concentration of ions inside and outside of the cell are good and comfortable for that cell. When we start to have the entry of positive ions like sodium in, it is going to start driving up the charge of this cell. That's what you're seeing here on this graph, a measuring of the charge in millivolts of that specific cell. If we have just a little bit of sodium entry or general positive ion entry into a cell, that is still called a depolarization. When we get enough sodium into a cell, about 15 millivolts away from its resting potential, you reach a specific charge called the threshold potential. What the threshold potential is, is the charge the cell needs to get to in order for the voltage-gated channels to open. Remember that whatever word comes before gated is what opens up that channel. So voltage-gated channels open not when a ligand binds to it. They open when that cell reaches a specific charge. So before, we just had ligand-gated channels binding ligands and letting in sodium in a transient way. Once we get to that threshold potential, that specific charge that the cell needs to be at, to open up its voltage-gated channels. We will see the massive opening of voltage-gated channels at this level of the axon hillock. And when those voltage-gated channels open, we're going to get the massive influx of sodium into the cell. Because this is a myelinated cell in this picture, that initial entry of sodium is going to spread really easily over this waxy cholesterol myelin to the first node of Ranvier. And that node of Ranvier also has a ton of voltage-gated channels. At the nodes of Ranvier, that is where you have voltage-gated channels. So that charge essentially is going to spread all the way down the length of the axon. And every time we get to a node of Ranvier, we'll have voltage-gated channels opening. That means this positive ion flow, this increase in charge, these are pluses, that's positivity. What we have is the spread of depolarization, the spread of activation. And 
once we have that happen, once we get to that threshold potential and we snap open the voltage gated channels, that is when an action potential is going to occur. That means that that cell is going to get to the charge it needs to get to in order to do its action, to do its activity. Once you get to threshold, it is all or nothing. The gates are open, sodium is coming in, this neuron is going to fire out some neurotransmitter. So we would say that the depolarized state of a neuron is when sodium channels are open and we get the influx of sodium ion into the cell. And that's going to drive up the charge. That's what you're basically seeing here on this graph, the charge going up because of sodium entry. Just like you and I, we can do stuff for a little bit, but kind of hate it after a little. We want to go back to resting potential. When a neuron gets to a very high charge, there's another group of channels that opens, and it is your potassium channels. Potassium channels snap open up here around the top of the action potential, and potassium is also a positive ion. And potassium is in high concentration inside of cells, so this neuron already has potassium in it. When potassium channels open, potassium will flow outside of the cell because of concentration gradients. It's high inside of cells, low outside of cells. So it will naturally flow that way whenever the channels open. So initially during depolarization, we have sodium entering the cell and then the cell gets up in charge and it decides it's had enough and it's gonna snap open its potassium channels. Losing a positive ion is going to start to drive that cell charge back towards what it was before, back towards its resting charge, its resting potential. And we refer to this phase as the repolarization phase. It's returning to its negative state. And that is predominated by the efflux then of potassium. I've definitely made a mess out of this picture now, but the last thing that I want to say after our repolarization, you'll notice that once the cell charge goes back to resting potential, so we became positive, that cell got to the charge it needs to do its action because sodium came in, then it goes back to its resting potential because potassium goes out, there's a little bit of time where that cell becomes excessively negative. We call that phase hyperpolarization. It, it is excessively negative. It is more negative than its resting potential. One of the main reasons that hyperpolarization happens is because once we get back to our resting potential, the potassium channels that we're letting out that positive ion potassium they're going to close, which means nothing's coming in and nothing's coming out through these sodium or potassium channels along the length of the axon. But what is still running is the sodium-potassium pump that trades three sodiums for two potassiums. And that is always running. It is an ATPase, and it needs to use ATP for energy because these things are moving against their concentration gradients, which means they're not flowing from high to low concentration. When we keep that pump on and the channels are shut, that's going to briefly lead the charge to become more negative than the resting potential. And we call that our hyperpolarization phase. Hyperpolarization is also a time that means that that cell is going to have a really difficult time being able to have another action potential. It is now inhibited, which we'll talk about in the next talk if you stay tuned, because what we will talk about is the three states that neurons can exist in and how that is affected by the cells around it. They can either be resting, at their resting charge, wherever they're comfortable, things are closed, the sodium potassium pump is running. They can be excited because they have a positive ion entry 
happening to them because they've been stimulated by excitatory neurons in the area. They can also be inhibited. They can be made less likely to have an action potential. So that's going to depend upon what's going on around them. And those spaces between neurons are called synapses. And that activity is referred to as synaptic transmission. So I hope you've learned the parts of the neuron and have a general handle on action potentials. It's just a charge. It's just a positive charge. It's just turning them on so that they do things. All right. I will see you next time. Stay smart.